All right. So deep inside the stem of the plant are the tubes that transport water. What are they? Xylem. Okay, a pea plant grows up a fence using vines stimulated by touch. Thigmotropism. Okay, number three, a bristlecone pine is the oldest tree in the world at 5,000 years. It can get this old because it always makes new cells using cytokinins. Okay, the blank layer of the leaf is responsible for photosynthesis. Rachel? Palisade. All right, the blank is a layer of wax secreted by the plant to prevent water loss. Omar? Cuticle. Okay, bananas ripen quickly because they produce lots of what? Ethylene. Hey, what does the phloem transport? Sugar. I would accept sugary sap as well. Hey, number eight, transpiration and blank create the force that pulls water up a plant. Osmosis. All right, give him a mark out of eight. Let him see it. Put it in the box. Okay, guys, listen up here. In your notes package, you need to go to the first lesson in Unit 3. Okay, so we're looking at physics now. Okay, um, you'll need a calculator in this unit, so you need to start bringing one with you. Okay, you're not going to need it right away, but uh, within a week, for sure, you're going to need it. Okay, so make sure that you are bringing it. Um, we'll be doing a fair amount of algebra in this unit as well, guys. Not early on, okay? But uh, we will be, all right? What we'll be doing will make the mole equation look really, really easy, all right? There will be some more complex algebra. Don't fear. Yeah, I'm not trying to scare you, all right? But understand that we will be doing a fair amount of algebra in this unit, okay? Um, so when we're doing this unit, if you're really struggling with the algebra, with the math, okay, um, think about that when you are deciding next year which courses you want to take. If bio went really good for you, you want to take bio 20. If chem went really good for you, take chem 20. If physics goes really good for you, take physics. Okay. If you struggle with physics but really like it, still take it. Okay. It's fine. Still take it. Okay. We want you to take things you like. Okay. But also understand that if you really, really struggled and just didn't get the math, it will get harder <laughs> when you go to physics 20. In the same way that if you really struggled with the mole equation, Chem is going to be difficult for you, okay, because they go way beyond that. Just little things to think about, okay, when you're deciding next year which sciences you want to take. That's the reason we take all three, okay, in Science 10. All right, so what we're going to look at today, guys, is energy. And energy is going to be a big theme in this unit. We're going to come back to it time and time again. We're going to basically to just talk, introduce it today, okay? We're going to start looking at it more in depth later on in the unit. We're going to look at how work and energy are related. We're going to start looking at it mathematically, okay? About uh, two weeks from now, we'll be doing work energy theorem, which is the most important um, concept in science in high school, okay? Um, it is in everything that you will ever do, all right? It's even... Uh, even though the chem people won't want to admit this, it's in chemistry too, a little bit, okay? But it's also really important, really important in physics. Okay, so we're going to look over kind of today just what is energy, what are the different kinds of energy, what can energy do, okay, stuff like that. What do we think energy is right now? Have we got an idea? Okay, what keeps you going, yep. Okay, can't be destroyed, also can't be created, okay? Um, that's odd, though, because we, we always sometimes think, always sometimes, that's not such good English. We sometimes think that energy can be created because we sort of see that. We see, you know, this uh, hydroelectric dam or these wind farms in Pincher Creek that are making electricity for us. Are they creating energy, though? No. They're transforming energy. They're converting energy from one form to another. They're, uh, the wind farms, for example, are converting ke uh, kinetic energy 
into electrical energy. All right? They're they're not creating it. Okay? They're harnessing it and they're transforming it into something else. And that's how we generate most of our electricity. Okay? Uh, for example, when we use coal, which is what we use in Alberta, over 90% of all electricity in Alberta is generated through the use of burning coal. All right? um, what we do when we burn coal is we use heat to change the state of water, turn it into steam, and then the steam becomes pressurized and turns a turbine and the turbine is attached to a generator and that makes electricity. 90%, actually more than 90% of all the electricity in Alberta is generated that way. All right, so it's a huge part of it. We'd all like to believe that everyone's house is powered by the windmills in Pincher Creek, but the reality is, is that represents about 4% of the grid in Alberta. Okay, So when Chinook Mall put up that big thing a few years ago saying they were the wind-powered mall and they were very green, it wasn't entirely true. It wasn't entirely a lie either. They were 4% powered by the windmills in Pincher Creek, just like everybody else in Alberta is. Right? But we're still transforming one form of energy into another. Okay? You can convert it. You can transfer it. Okay? But you can't create it. The strict definition of energy is this. Energy is the ability to do work. Okay? Energy is the ability to do work. Okay, so you know when your parents this weekend say go out and shovel off the driveway or the sidewalk, and you go, I don't have any energy. I can't do that. First of all, you were lying because you certainly had energy, or you wouldn't have been able to say anything to them. Okay, um, but if it was true that you had no energy, certainly you would not be able to do any work. Okay, because energy is the ability to do work, and when we don't feel energetic, we don't feel like doing work. Okay, but that's not the sort of physical definition of it. Okay, in order to do work, you have to have energy. So as an example, if I'm holding this heavy hole punch above my toe, all right, does it have energy? Yes, because if I were to drop it, it would be able to do work on my toe. Agreed? It would change the shape of my toe in an undesirable way. Right? Why does it have energy right here? What can it do in this position? What could it do? Fall. Yeah. It's got the potential. The potential to fall. It has potential energy. If I were to let it go, that potential energy would turn into kinetic energy, and then it would do work on my foot. All right. Everyone follow me there? So something perched precariously on the top of a building has potential energy because it has the potential to do work on anything that is below it. All right. That's why uh, when you hammer a nail, you have to lift the hammer and then swing it downwards. Okay? You're giving it energy. You're lifting it up, and then your muscles are swinging it. You're putting kinetic energy into it, and that kinetic energy has the ability to drive the nail into the wood. All right? So if you have energy, you can do work. Okay? So what's work? Works a transfer or a change in energy. It's almost like I'm saying right is left and up is down here. Okay? And I am kind of. Because work is energy, really. Okay? I can't do work if I don't have energy because work is transferring energy to something else. And you can't give away what you don't have. Right? There's no energy credit card. Right? That says you can you know, spend money you don't really have. Okay? If you don't have energy, you can't do work on something. Everyone follow me there? Right? So if you're lying flat on the ground, okay, you don't have any energy. Right? Because you can't fall on anything and you're not moving. So you don't have any ability to do any work. All right? So work is a transfer or a change in energy. If I, let's say, pick up this stool and put it up here, have I done work? Okay. How do I know? Okay. What does the stool have now? 
It has potential energy. It didn't have any potential energy on the floor because it was as low as it could go. It couldn't fall any farther. Right? But now, it can. It has a certain amount of energy because I did that amount of work in lifting it to the top of the table. All right? So that's the relationship between work and energy. We'll talk more about that okay, later on in the unit. But that is the work energy theorem. And it is the most important concept you will learn in high school science. All right, the Inuit blanket toss is this thing that's in the textbook. But it's a good example of energy and different types of energy. All right, um, what the Inuit used to, why the Inuit used to do this is because in the north, in the tundra, it's very, very flat. All right, there's no trees. Tundra actually means treeless. Okay, it's an arctic prairie. And so it's miles and miles of nothing. It's like Saskatchewan. Southern Saskatchewan. Okay, you can see from one side of the province to the other. Okay, now the problem is is that there's a horizon and you can't see anything past the horizon, so it's difficult to sneak up on, like caribou and things like that if you're trying to hunt them. So what they would do is they would put the lightest, smallest person they had on the blanket, and the rest of them would throw them up in the air with the blanket because if you're higher up, you can see farther, right? And so they could see over the horizon and see caribou that were further away, and then they would be able to kind of plan a strategy to encircle them, and, and then they would be able to hunt them down. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? In order for that person to get up here, what are all these people having to do? Well, they're giving this person kinetic and then potential energy, but what are they doing? Work, exactly, because work is a transfer of energy. They're transferring their energy. They're changing this person's energy from zero to something else. All right. What are the units for energy? Joules, right. Okay, joules are the units for energy. All right. So forms of energy here. Okay, the, the big thing about energy is for a very long time, and even now to some extent, it's difficult to define what energy is because it's not matter. Okay, it's not a solid or a liquid or a gas that you can touch or that you can capture. Okay, or things like that. So it was difficult to experiment with because it wasn't something that was material. Okay? And so it was very difficult for people to explain what it was, and it was very difficult for them to experiment with measure and things like that. So this idea of energy took a lot of forms through its development. Okay? Um, you know, there were people saying energy is like this invisible fluid that flows through everything. Okay? Which at the time sort of made sense because they could sort of see you know, heat waves, which were evidence of energy being transferred uh, from one thing to another. Okay? They knew if they set a hot cup of water next to a cool cup of water that the cool cup of water would get warmer and the hot cup of water would get cooler, all right? And they said, well, th there must be this invisible fluid that we can't see that goes from one to the other. And it kind of made sense to explain things, but it also implied that energy was material, and it's not, okay? While energy does flow from place to place like a liquid, it isn't a liquid, okay? It's nothing. It's no material at all. All right. So, um, sun's energy causes snow to melt in the spring, okay? Because the sun strikes it and the, the snow absorbs energy, reaches its melting point, changes state. Okay? A person who's just run a marathon uses up a lot of energy. That's why you often see people collapse when they cross the finish line. I think they're just being drama queens, but okay, sometimes they are completely out of energy and they do just physically collapse when they get there. All right? um, we only see evidence of energy, though, when something is done. All right? I mean, the coffee cup there has got energy, but can you see it? Not really, but if it fell off and dented or hit the floor and made sound, then we have evidence that there's energy around because it's something then that we can observe. All right? But energy was difficult to quantify when people say, well, that thing's got energy. Well, how do you know? I can't see it. I can't measure it. I can't do this with it. Okay? That's what made it sort of difficult. So it was only through observing changes okay, um, that scientists started to get a clear picture of what the concept of energy was. In fact, we were using energy to do stuff long before we really understood what it was. It's one of those backwards things in, in science where we used something that we didn't understand and then began to understand it okay, as a result, as opposed to learning about it and then using it. 
Okay. So by the 1850s, scientists were convinced that there was this scientific concept called energy. Okay. However, energy was still difficult to describe because it was an abstract idea, like we said, not a material object. Okay. Experimental evidence had showed that heat was another form of energy. Okay. Um, in fact, that's not even really true. We shouldn't say heat here. We should say thermal energy because heat is a transfer of thermal energy, where work is a transfer of mechanical energy. So we often say heat's a form of energy, but it really isn't. Thermal energy is a form of energy, and heat is a transfer of that. So we feel heat because a hot object is transferring its energy to us, okay? And that's why we say heat's a form of energy when it really isn't, okay? It's a transfer of thermal energy from one thing to another. Okay, that's why we often say something is cold, okay? Is it really cold or is it just that it's taking energy from us? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's colder in temperature than we are, okay? But it also uh, feels cold because we're losing energy to that object. When you make a snowball with your bare hands, okay, your hands get cold because you're transferring thermal energy to the snow. And you're, as a result, you get colder. All right, so the different forms of energy. The most common form of energy used on Earth, okay, and as a result, really the first kind that was ever sort of quantified or discovered, is chemical energy. Okay. Chemical energy is the energy stored within the chemical bonds of matter. Okay. Does all material have chemical energy? To some extent, yes, but okay, most uh, it, practically no. Okay, lots of things do. Fuels, for example, all do have lots of chemical energy. Food has chemical energy. Okay, your, the the gasoline in your car has chemical energy. The propane in your barbecue has chemical energy. The wood in your fireplace has chemical energy. Right? Can you see that? No, but you know it's there when it starts to burn. Right? Because when it starts to burn, the reaction that's breaking the molecules apart while it reacts with oxygen is releasing energy. It's releasing thermal energy to you. All right, is everyone following me on that one? All right, so for a long time, and the alchemists knew this, okay, they knew that there were what they called hidden secrets, okay, in chemical reactions, because of course they had to be very secretive about everything, okay, um, and they knew that certain things burned hotter than others, right? That was an important discovery. I mean, it's common sense now, but it was an important discovery to know that if I burn, let's say, a pound of wood, I get less energy than if I burn a pound of coal. All right? So coal had more hidden secrets in it than wood did. All right? Really what it is is that coal has more chemical energy in it than wood does because it's a different molecule and it has, as a result has more bonds that can be broken. The more bonds that can be broken, the more chemical energy you have. All right? So that's why burning propane doesn't release as much heat as burning octane, the stuff that's in gasoline. Right? One has more chemical bonds than the other. Okay? The longer the molecule, the more chemical bonds there are to break, the more energy is stored in them. Okay. Uh, so they began mixing certain chemicals that could produce surprising, often disastrous results. Okay? The science of chemistry began. Okay? It wasn't until the 1800s, though, when we talked about this guy, Lavoisier. Okay? Equal amounts of different substances were burned um, produce different amounts of heat, and that's what I just said there. A pound of wood versus a pound of coal. Get way more heat out of a pound of coal, okay, because it has more chemical energy. All right, so when wood burns, the energy in the cellulose molecules is released. That's what happens in chemical energy. Chemical energy is a form of potential energy. P.S., whatever I underline, you should do. Okay, chemical energy is the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of compounds. That energy gets released when the bonds are broken. All right, so when you digest food, okay, you get energy from it. Okay, when that food, when those food particles, the sugars, whatever, are burned in the mitochondria and they're not really set on fire, they're just broken down. Okay, in the mitochondria of your cells, the energy within them is released and that's what runs your body. All right, electricity, electrical energy, and magnetism. Okay, these were also important discoveries. Okay, um, it's the work done by moving charges. 
Now, which charges can move, positive ones or negative ones? Negative, because negative charges are produced by which particle? Electrons. Electrons are the ones that can move, remember, because protons are in the nucleus and they can't move. All right? So, the flowing of electrons is electricity, moving charges. Okay? That's why a, uh, a battery always has a positive pole and a negative pole. All right? Which pole do the electrons come out of? They come out the negative pole. Okay? They go out the negative and in the positive. Okay? Less electrons out the negative, more electrons in the positive. Right? Okay? That's the way it flows. I know it seems counterintuitive, but okay, that's the way it goes. All right, so um, this little invention right here on the right is known as the Volta Pile. Okay? An Italian scientist named Alessandro Volta developed this. He had different metals and he had moistened paper in between them. Okay? And he found that these different metals would kind of have a solution with the moistened paper in between and electrons would move through the moistened paper into the different disks of metal. Okay? And as they did that, if he connected the top one to the bottom one, he found that electricity would flow through the wire. Not for very long, okay? because there was only a certain amount of potential energy stored in this and after a while it would go dead. All right? But this was the first battery. All right? That's why we often see written on battery packages, pile alkaline batteries because they come from this idea the volta pile and they are often a pile of small cells okay inside okay making the battery a battery is a collection of cells okay electrical cells not living cells all right so he had this moistened paper sandwiched between each layer okay wire connected either end to an uh, external circuit okay it produced a constant electrical current Right, so let's say we should probably know the Volta pile and Alessandro Volta. Okay, this device constituted the first battery. And what it did is it showed that you could convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Okay, that was kind of a big step. Knowing that one could be converted into the other kind of led to the development of modern electrical systems. Now, how is magnetism a form of energy? Can magnets do work? Sure they can, right? They can pick up other objects as long as they're attracted to, magnet, to magnets. Okay? But the big thing is that magnets and electricity, or magnetic fields and electrical fields, are very closely related. If you take physics 30, there's a whole unit on forces and fields that has to do with this. Okay? Um, but essentially for our level, what we need to understand is that one can produce effects of the other. So electric electricity can produce magnetic effects. Okay? And magnets can produce electric effects. So um, let's say, for example, you were um, you had a you were standing underneath like a big power line. Okay, you sometimes hear the buzzing, you know, of a big power line and whatever. Okay, so there's electricity flowing through this power line, and if you were standing there and you had a compass, your compass wouldn't work quite right. Okay, because the flowing charges produce a magnetic field around the wire, all right? And that wire, that magnetic field, okay, can cause different effects to happen. One of them being to interfere with compasses. It can also interfere with cell phones. Right? and other transmitting things. If you've ever noticed in your house, if you're on your Wi-Fi and someone fires up the microwave and you're too close to the microwave, what happens to your Wi-Fi? It goes out. Yeah. Okay. You won't get any Wi-Fi signal because of the magnetic interference produced by your microwave. Yes. Okay. So these ideas here is that they go together. One produces effects of the other. All right. So first person to discover this was a guy named Orsted. Okay, he was doing this demonstration for his, his students actually in a in a lecture, and he discovered it almost completely by accident. Um, he had an electrical wire set up like this, and he had electrons flowing through it, and he happened to have a compass sitting nearby that he was using for something else. Um, but what he noticed is as soon as he turned on the electricity, the compass aligned with the wire. 
Okay, so it was originally pointing north, and as soon as he hooked up the circuit, it immediately went and lined up with the electrical current, pointed in the same direction as the electrical current rather than north. All right, and what that told him is is that the electrical wire must produce a magnetic field, and because the compass was so close to it, it ended up being stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, just because it was close, not because it was actually stronger. All right, as soon as he turned off the electricity, the compass went back to north. Okay, turned on the electricity, and it went straight with the wire. Needless to say, he didn't accomplish very much in that lecture that day because he was too engrossed in what was happening with his wire compass apparatus. Okay? But it was an important discovery because it led to the ideas on how to use magnets to help generate electricity. And this was Faraday's big discovery. He discovered that when you push a magnet through a wire, the magnet forces the electrons in the wire to start moving. Okay? So, as you push the wire into the or sorry, push the magnet into the coil of wire, the electrons begin to flow. As soon as it's, as soon as you stop moving the magnet, the electron flow stops. So the magnetic field produced by the magnet pushes on the electrons and causes a current. Okay? And so he discovered you could generate electricity by having this magnet move back and forth very quickly, constantly pushing the electrons and making them move. Okay? Everyone following me there? All, right, so all that we're looking at here is people are discovering forms of energy by their effects. Okay? Not because they could see them, okay? not because they could see electricity or see magnetism, but because they could see the effects. They could see that work was getting done, and that's what caused them to believe they were types of energy. Okay? This, electrical f this electric field here did work in moving the compass. Okay? This magnetic field did work in moving the electrons. Therefore, they were forms of energy. All right. So uh, this thing here about Orsted is important. Okay, you got to know that one. Faraday is an important guy as well. Okay? And then, because electricity was becoming so big, People wanted to be able to convert heat directly into electricity because they figured, you know what, anybody can start a fire. If we can get fire to make electricity, man will really be able to modernize things. Problem is that conversion is incredibly inefficient. All right? Heat directly to electricity is very difficult to do. All right? In fact, essentially nobody does it. It's used basically to trip circuits in the case of an overload. Okay, if you've ever had your circuit breaker go in your house and you had to go downstairs and flick the switch back over, anyone had that happen? Okay, you blew a breaker, right? That's essentially what trips the breaker. When the circuit gets hot enough, there's enough current produced to trip the switch. Okay. Right, so the guy that discovered this, okay, his name was Thomas Seebeck, okay, and he made what's called a thermoelectric converter or a thermocouple. Okay. What he did is he took two different types of metal because different types of metal transfer heat at different rates. Okay. Copper is a very good conductor of heat. It is also a very good conductor of electricity. Iron, on the other hand, doesn't conduct either one very well. All right. So what he did is he connected these two, essentially welded them together, right, and put a compass needle in between. Okay. The compass needle he had originally pointing north. And he started heating up the iron here. And as the, he heated up the iron, the atoms in the iron started moving faster because that's what things do when they get hot. Okay? Um, and then it started transferring energy not only through the iron, but also through the copper. But which one did it transfer quicker through? Right. And as a result, more electrons started flowing through this part than they did through this part. And what that caused was an electric current, which produced a magnetic field and caused the compass needle to point straight along the copper bar. Okay, so he confirmed that yes, you can convert heat directly into electricity. The problem is it's incredibly inefficient. It does not produce very much electricity. Okay, not nearly as efficient as other methods. All right, everyone with me there? Okay. So essentially, that showed yeah that en heat energy could be converted to other forms. All right, um, nuclear and solar energy. Okay, we talked a little bit about nuclear energy. We talked about the structure of the atom. Okay, within the atom, there's energy stored. Within each individual atom, that amount of energy is puny. All right, but if we have large numbers of atoms, that energy can be colossal. All right, if we're looking at 
nuclear fission by splitting an atom, okay, we release the electromagnetic energy that was holding it together previously. As soon as it breaks, that energy is released. If we break enough atoms, we get lots and lots of energy, especially if they're big atoms like uranium, plutonium, and things like that. Okay? Within the sun, however, that's not the process that goes on. Within the sun, we use what's called nuclear fusion. Okay, well, we don't use it. The sun uses it. And it happens because the sun is so incredibly big. Okay, to give you an idea, the Earth's mass is this much. 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The sun's mass, by comparison, is about eight and a half million times greater. Okay. Huge, huge mass difference. And the sun is made up almost entirely of hydrogen, which is the lightest of all elements. So can you imagine how much hydrogen must be in the sun? Lots. Okay. So because the sun is so massive, it also has a lot of gravity. That's what keeps all the planets orbiting it. Okay? But because it has so much gravity, it's pulling all of these hydrogen atoms together. Okay? And it's, there's so much pull there that it actually produces enough heat to force the atoms together. Okay? So two atoms of hydrogen, okay? so a proton and an electron, okay? they get squished together so hard that they form, okay? essentially, a helium atom. Okay, the process of doing that releases exponentially more energy than a fission reaction does. Okay, nuclear fusion is far more energetic than nuclear fission is. This is the this is the reaction that powers the sun. Okay, for a long time people thought the sun was a chemical fire because you know they looked up at the sun and went, oh, that's bright, but it kind of looks like a fire. So they figured it was just a big fire in space. It is a big fire in space but it's not a chemical fire for a couple of reasons. There's no oxygen in space. The fire won't burn. Okay. Secondly, if the sun was actually a chemical fire, it would have run out of fuel in 5,000 years. That would have been a problem. Okay. So it is a big nuclear fire in space. Now, how many people heard this huge hoax joke thing about the six days of darkness? Somebody put this big hoax out, okay? made it look like it came from NASA, it all looked very official, okay? that there was going to be this big solar storm and the sun was going to be blocked out for six days in December. And people bought it hook, line, and sinker. Okay? There was like panic okay, in places and people were reading this thing and, and believing that this would happen. Okay? Now, what are some reasons why that could not possibly happen. Anyone know? Think of some reasons why that immediately upon reading that you would go, that can't be true. How big is the sun? Really big. Anything that could block out the sun would produce far bigger problems than blocking out the sun okay, in our solar system. All right? It would essentially gravitationally throw everything in our solar system out. All right? So yeah, wrong. Okay. Secondly, What's the only source of energy for the Earth? The sun. Okay, they were talking about you know what you needed to do because the sun was going to be gone for six days and whatever. If the sun was gone for six days, you're screwed. You don't need to do anything except die. Okay, because that's how it's going to happen. Okay, if the sun was gone, okay, its energy was gone for like even let's say two or three hours. You can't imagine how quick the temperature of this planet would drop. All right. This planet requires a constant input of energy. To lose the sun for six days would have turned Earth into a frozen ball. Okay? And each and every one of us into little people sickles. All right? So yeah, that's not going to happen either. All right? So all of these things, but people bought it. Like You should have seen how much like retweets and likes and whatever and shares on Facebook it had. It was crazy okay? that people bought this, this idea. All right? The sun is not going away for six days. You don't have to panic because you guys are all smarter than that and you knew it was a hoax. If you'd seen it, you'd have known it was a hoax right away. All right. So, uh, nuclear energy. Okay. What's nuclear energy? It's the energy, it's potential energy stored within the nucleus of an atom. Okay. We often think, though, that nuclear energy is heat.
the effects of nuclear energy are heat. Okay? But nuclear energy itself is the potential stored within the nucleus of the atom. Okay? When the nucleus of an atom is split, that's nuclear fission, or when the nuclei of two atoms combine or fused, okay, energy is released. All right, and like we said here, solar energy results from a hydrogen-hydrogen nuclear fission reaction. Okay, and luckily for us, our sun is what we call a main sequence G-type star, okay, that will burn happily for about another five and a half billion years. All right, so it's a, it's a good kind of star to have because it sticks around for a long time. If you have a massive supergiant star, you would be lucky if you have it for a few million years. Okay, as opposed to the lifespan of ours, which is tens of billions of years. Okay, um, the bigger a star is, the faster the nuclear reactions happen, because the more pressure and more gravity there is. Okay, so a big, a really big supergiant star might only last a few million years because it'll actually go through its fuel, even though it has way more of it, way faster. Okay, we've got a good star. We'll keep it. Okay, and it won't go out for six days in December. All right, motion and energy. So we talked about potential energy, okay, when we had stuff being lifted onto the table, okay, but there's also kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of movement. If something is moving, it can do work, okay? You know this if you've ever had someone run into you while you were standing, okay? They had kinetic energy and they hit you and you, like, stepped forward or fell down or whatever. They did work on you because they had kinetic energy, all right? Now, this little device here, okay, got people into big, big trouble. Okay? This is Newton's cradle, is what it's called. And it got Newton into big trouble. Because when he built it, and pulled the one ball up, and it hit the other ball, and the ball on the other side went up, people went, you're a witch. Because at that time, people were believed in witches, and they thought that it, he was doing something like magical, and he nearly got his head cut off over that. Okay? Yeah. All it does, though, is prove that energy can be transferred. Okay? from one object to another. Okay? By lifting up the ball on this end, what has he done? He's given it potential energy because he's done work. When he releases it, that potential energy turns into kinetic as the ball moves faster. When the ball strikes the next ball in line, it can't move. The energy literally flows through the rest of these and into the ball on the end. And then that ball, since nothing is stopping it, rises up to about the same height he lifted the original ball. Not obviously exactly the original height, because every time that happens, some energy is lost. How do we know energy is lost each time? Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah, okay, we can hear the sound. Sound's a form of energy. If you hear sound, it means that some of the kinetic and potential energy that the ball had is being transferred to the surroundings. There'd also be a little bit of heat, okay, and things like that. So yeah, okay, this showed unequivocally that energy, that, you know, Potential energy was a form of energy. Kinetic energy was a form of energy because they could do work, okay, and that they could be transferred from one object to another. All right, so it was an important discovery, even though it got them into a lot of hot water. Okay, um, so they watched this uh, Newton's cradle thing. Okay, they had no idea why the ball went up there. Okay, but Newton explained it to them. All right, a little bit later, a German philosopher and mathematician named Gottfried Leibniz, okay, reasoned that whatever caused the ball to move resembled a force that could be transmitted through the balls. Okay? He called this physical quantity vis viva, okay? which meant living force. This was really the first time energy was actually given a name. It wasn't the right name, but that's what he gave it. Okay? It's not a force, okay? but it was like a force because it could do stuff and it could move things. Okay? All right. Now, he reasoned that there had to be essentially two forms of energy, and an object could have one or the other or both. Okay, so he said if something is moving, it has kinetic energy. All right, so if something can do work, okay, because of its energy, it has kinetic energy. If something has the potential to do work, okay, because of its position, it has gravitational potential energy, like when we lifted the stool onto the table. If something is moving and is above the ground, it has both. All right, he didn't want to name that sort of separately. So what he said is the sum of these two energy types 
is mechanical energy. Is mechanical, right? Okay, that's what he's saying. Mechanical energy equals kinetic plus potential. Alright, let's say we have a building, okay, and we have a person on the top of the building who's going to drop a ball, right? So it follows this path down to the ground. Where does the ball have the most mechanical energy? It has the most kinetic energy there. It has the most potential energy when he's going to drop it. It has the most mechanical energy everywhere. Trick question, right? Here's why. Up here, he hasn't dropped it yet. It only has what kind of energy? Down here, it can't fall any further. It only has kinetic. If mechanical energy is the sum of these two, and they're changing into each other, their sum is always the same number. Okay, the amount of kinetic is always changing, the amount of potential is always changing, but since potential is changing into kinetic, what they add up to is always the same number. Up here, let's say that we had, let's say, 100 joules of energy up here. It's all potential, right? Okay, mechanical energy is potential plus kinetic, so it's 100 plus nothing. Everyone follow me on that? Okay. Here, <clears throat> it's fallen a little ways, so it has less potential energy now. Let's say it's got 80 joules of potential energy, but now it's moving. It wasn't before, so it has 20 joules of kinetic. Halfway down, maybe it's 50-50. Down at the bottom, it can't fall any further, but it's moving a lot faster, so it has more kinetic. But the amount of energy, total energy it has, never changes all the way down. Okay? It would only change if it did work on something. Right? So the instant it strikes the ground, yeah, it's going to lose energy then. The instant it strikes the ground, some of its energy will be turned into sound, some will be turned into heat, and some will be turned into changing the shape of the object and the ground. Okay? Everyone follow me on that? Okay. Heat and energy. Okay? Heat and energy is probably, again, the relationship we use the most okay, in our modern world. We call the relationship between heat and energy thermodynamics. Okay? So it's a science of the study of the interactions between heat, work, and energy. All right? People discovered that mechanical energy and heat were very closely related. In fact, one could be converted to the other very easily. But more often than not, it was mechanical energy being converted into heat and not the other way around. Right? The first person who discovered this okay, uh, was a guy uh, who was actually the uh, Minister of War in Bavaria. Okay? We'll talk about that actually down here in a minute. Um, first we'll talk about Joseph Black here. Okay? He observed something about the transfer of energy. And he found that it was the same as the transfer of materials in nature, in cells, and things like that. Okay? We said that everything diffuses from high concentrations to low concentrations. Well, energy, especially heat, does the same thing. It always moves from a hot object to a cold object. All right? You cannot transfer coldness. All right? You're not, you can't transfer coldness from one thing to another, but you can transfer heat away from a hot object. So heat always flows in one direction. Okay? It flows from the hotter object to the colder object. Okay? And that's what Joseph Black discovered. Okay? If you place a cold object in a cup of hot water, very shortly thereafter, the cold object is warmer. And the water is cooler. Okay? Because it's transferred some of its energy to the object. That's what gives us this idea that we can transfer coldness. Okay? Is that, well, that object, this, this got colder. So it, the coldness must have come from the cold object, but it isn't that way. The heat is always going from the hot to the cold. Okay? That's what makes the hot object seem like it got colder. It did, but only because it gave its energy to something else. All right? 
Everyone following me there? Okay. You can't give away debt is essentially what I'm saying. All right. Um, so, uh, heat. He suggested that heat was this invisible fluid I talked about earlier, okay, um, which naturally flows from hot to cold things. He wasn't entirely wrong. He was wrong about the fluid part, but we do know that heat does flow from hot to cold. Okay. All right, and around his time, people were also talking about how the theory of atomic motion explained heat. We know that as you heat something up, the atoms and particles and whatever in it move faster. Okay? If something's moving faster, there's going to be more collisions between the molecules or atoms, and as a result, those collisions can be transferred to something else. Okay. All right, so the transfer of thermal energy from a hot object to a cold object is called heat. Okay, now, heat and mechanical energy, all right? Benjamin Thompson, who for some reason changed his name later to Count Rumford, okay, became the Minister of War in Bavaria. His job was to supervise the production of cannons, okay? Cannons are built by taking a big lump of metal and boring it out with a big drill, all right? Um... So what he found was that the people he had boring out these big chunks of metal, and they just had a big hand-operated drill, so they would be going like this and cranking this drill that would be boring a hole into this big chunk of metal. The hole would be where the, the powder and the cannonball would go. Um, he found that as they bored this out, the metal got ridiculously hot. Okay? The metal that was to become the cannon got really, really hot. In fact, so hot that what the workers would do is they would put a tea kettle on the cannon they were working on. Okay, fill it with water and start boring out the cannon. Okay, they knew it was time for a coffee break when the tea kettle would boil because they could actually get the metal that hot. Okay, just by cranking this, this big drill, this big auger, okay, inside this piece of metal, they could generate enough heat to boil a, cup, to boil a kettle of water on top. Needless to say, you wanted to stay away from that or wear gloves while you were at work, okay? Because if you got tired and went like this and leaned on the cannon, you were going to have problems, all right? Because you would obviously burn your hand pretty severely. The cannon got hot enough to boil water, okay? So he, was, he found then that what was happening was energy was being converted from one form to another. Where was the energy coming from? Okay, and how was that thing moving? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It came from the people's mechanical energy, and it actually came from the people's chemical energy. Whatever food they ate for breakfast before they came to work, okay, they were burning in order to turn this big drill. Okay, so by turning the drill, they had mechanical energy. That's movement. Okay, kinetic energy. Okay, mechanical energy. They were moving the drill. Okay, the resistance meant they were doing work. They were changing the shape. Okay, of the of the cannon, and that resulted in heat. Okay, because you had moving parts rubbing against each other. There's a lot of friction. Okay, and that's converting their mechanical energy to thermal energy enough so to boil the tea kettle sitting on top. Okay, um, so that's what he found. Heat was being generated. Okay, by boring out. Okay. All right. So Rumford suggested. Okay, that heat. Um, could be manufactured by the motion of his workers. Okay? He was the first to realize that mechanical energy and heat were related. Okay? Once they realized that those two types of energy were related, they were, uh, there was all kinds of work being done on converting one form of energy to another. Okay? Thomas Young, okay? also an important person in terms of discovery and use of energy, okay? he took Leibniz's theory of kinetic and potential energy in moving objects, okay? and he used it to generate this idea about it being able to do work, okay? that energy could do work. Okay? So that's what we got here. This was Thomas Young's kind of big thing here. Thomas Young linked mechanical energy okay, to, to this. Okay? It had the ability to be turned into other forms. Questions on that? Okay. All right, then Joule. Since the unit for energy is named after this guy, he's probably the most important guy. 
Okay, that's generally how it goes. All right, the units for force are named after Newton. All right, so um, the units for energy are named after Joule. He's probably the most important guy in terms of energy. All right, so some things that were discovered. Okay, experiments were being performed that transformed heat into mechanical energy. That's a difficult conversion. Very easy to can go to go the other way around. Okay, he discovered the transformation of heat into mechanical energy could only occur when thermal energy flowed from a hot object to a cold object. So he built this theoretical, so he didn't really build it, it was just theoretical, heat engine. All right, he had hot over here, cold over here, so a heat source and a heat sink, and he had a motor in between. All right, if you have a motor in between connected to these two things, heat flows through the motor on its way to the cold object. And if that heat is in a fluid of some kind, in a material, the material will also flow a little bit. You get kind of a current, a convection current set up. Okay? As that material moves, then it will turn the engine, okay? resulting in you turning heat into mechanical energy. All right? How long will that last for? Well, it'll last until this and this are now not hot and cold, but because once they're the same temperature, is there any flow anymore? Well, there is, but it's back and forth, and that's not doing you any good. Okay? So the greater the difference in heat or thermal energy between the two sides, the faster the motor flows. Okay? This is how a jet engine works. Right? Jet engines work by having an area that's very, very hot and some turbines, and then behind that area is the very cold air, of comparatively very cold air of the atmosphere. Okay? And as a result, air moves through the jet engine and turns the turbines that force the jet forward. All right? That's how a jet engine works. All right? So it is essentially just a heat engine. All right? Okay, so that was important. Okay, Sadiq Carnot did this whole thing on heat into mechanical energy, and it could only occur okay, when we had thermal energy flowing from hot to cold. Okay, what uh, Joule did okay, is Joule did work with the opposite, proving mechanical energy could be converted into heat, and that potential energy was still a form of energy. The gravitational potential energy was a form of energy. So he had these two experiments here. Okay? This one's probably the easiest to explain and the most obvious. If you have this stationary block and this falling block, so you lift this block up and out of the way, okay, what have you done? You've given it potential energy because you've done work. Okay? People said potential energy is not really a form of energy because the object's not moving. It's not doing any work. Okay? His proof that potential energy was a form of energy was by letting go of the block. What does the block do? Yeah, and it falls and it smashes into this block. All right? And people went, so? Everybody knows that'll happen. He said, yeah, but look what happened to the temperature of the stationary block. Okay? As soon as this block hits this block, the temperature goes up. Okay, you can try this at home. Take a piece of wood and a hammer. Okay, not a nice piece of wood, not like furniture. Okay, like an old two by four, and just pound it in the same place with the hammer about ten times, and then put your finger there. It'll be hotter. All right, because when you stop the hammer, the energy has to go somewhere. Some of it is sound. Okay, but you're also deforming the wood every time you hit it, and that deformation can also produce a lot of heat. So he proved that the potential energy of a falling object could be converted to other forms, and then as a result, was a form of energy in itself. All right, and that was a pretty important discovery. He did the same thing here with these falling masses on the pulley. Okay, they spun these little blades inside this jar, okay, and so as they fell and the blades began to turn, the temperature inside the jar would go up. Okay, the air resistance between the blades and the air inside the jar will result in the jar's temperature increasing. Okay, so that's the sort of proof that potential energy is a form of mechanical energy because it could be converted into heat. All right. Okay, I want you guys to answer the circled questions, please. Okay, so we're looking at 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, sorry, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 10, 12, 13, and 14. Okay, are they circled on yours? Okay, so circle them on yours. 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 10, 12, 13, and 14. 
okay those are easy quiz material type questions